<laughs> okay, well, I'm going to introduce Roy. Um, first off, I don't know how many of you guys were here when Roy spoke earlier in the year, but I was in attendance, and when they said that I was going to be introducing Roy, I was like, this place better be packed. Because <laughs> when Roy left here last time, he told us this place needs to be doubled in size of people. And uh, he didn't like just kind of mention it. He was like, this better happen. So um, I don't know if that happened. I don't think it happened. But <laughs> I, I, was scared. I was scared that I had uh, announced him because of that. And then but Roy, he was an Ohio State football player, wide receiver. Uh, he also played wide receiver in the NFL. And he is also the founder of the organization Driven. And basically, they motivate those who are challenged to produce a never quit attitude. So he's a real special guy. He's one of my favorite guys to hear speak so far at AIA. And uh, we're blessed to have him. So thank you very much. I don't use the mic. I never, I never do. Uh, appreciate you, big guy, for the introduction and you guys for being here. Uh, definitely not double in size. Uh, but I'll attribute that to the to the nice weather and, and all that good stuff, final exams or whatever you guys got coming up. Uh, I'm not going to be here too too long and take up too much of your time, but there are some, some major things I want to hit on. And as I kind of listen to your guys' testimonies and different information that you guys are going for and the upperclassmen sharing about experiences and, and really the impact um, of AIA on your lives and just different things that you guys have acquired over the course of the year is definitely very encouraging. Um, it's very encouraging to see that you guys are um, at least uh, digesting some of the things that you guys experience in here and outside of these walls pertaining to your Christian, Christian walk and this process and this journey, which is absolutely awesome for student athletes. Uh, however, <laughs> however, um, I can't help again but notice that there are missing seats. And uh, there's a lot of availability for people uh, to interact and to receive this gift that we have from the heavens above. And so the last time I was here, there was a gold medal going around. And so maybe it was the uh, excitement about what happened in the Olympics. Uh, maybe it was just that energy, just the winning atmosphere. Maybe it was a time of year, I don't really know. But I know that day, it was people sitting on the back, it was people in the, the doorway, you know, it was just packed. I mean, it was probably six or seven chairs, I don't know where the extra chairs went and they came from, but it was a lot of people in here. And so my point is, from a Christian standpoint and perspective, you see it across the board, you see it in churches and large bodies of Christ, and then you see it individually all the time where somebody starts off on fire, so to speak, and they're very bold and candid, and they want to talk about Christ and their walk, and they come to all the meetings, they go to all the Bible studies, they, they interact, they want to do outreach, they're asking questions, they're reading their Bible, they downloaded the Bible app finally that they didn't even know existed, right? They did all these things, they're taking notes, they got a journal, and then like over the course of the year, over the course of the next few months, they just kind of tail off. And it's like, how does that happen? Like, how is that possible? As a student athlete, you guys know that you guys can't afford to tail off. I mean, you're talking playing time, you're talking injuries start to occur when you're not giving maximum effort, when you're not focused, when you're not locked in. A lot of negative things happen, and the same thing can be said about your walk with Christ when you're not focused and when you're not locked in. So as I look around the room, not only is it and has it not been a priority for you guys to consistently, consistently invite and consistently make sure your brothers and sisters in this room are in here, but it definitely is not a priority for those people that aren't in here. Now, I'm bold enough to say that because I really believe that if I had took my walk with Christ a little bit more serious when I was in college, if I had came to an actual AIA meeting, which I never even came to, maybe one when I was here, and Tom was my mentor, and I never showed up. But if I was just a little bit more committed, had a little bit more of a priority to me, Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I wouldn't have had a kid as soon as I got to the NFL. Maybe I would have took that a little bit more serious. Now, I love my, my son. I love my daughter, too. But my point is, if I had been locked in a little bit more, maybe I would have did things the right way, even past Ohio State. 
Because that's the part that we're preparing you for. As long as it's comfortable, if Ohio State gives you everything, student athletes, room board, pay for it, books, all that good stuff. You guys really don't have to wait for classes and all that good stuff. You have nice air conditioning, your own section. You got food, snacks, all that good stuff. AI provides nice, nice things and guest speakers and people come from all over the, the country to talk to you guys, and that's awesome. But what are you guys gonna do when you leave here? Because that's where I dropped the ball. When I went to the NFL and all of a sudden what God blessed me with, this thing that I've been praying for to make it to the NFL, when I had an opportunity to exercise what I know into my behavior, I didn't capitalize on it and I, and I dropped the ball, I failed. Because I went to the NFL, you got money in your pocket and you have no accountability. Mom's not around, Tom's not around. I'm all good. Tom knows people around campus, by the way. You can't get with nothing around campus. You, you know, he knows, right? They know. Old Rody fam, I have no idea how. They just know. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like all the student athletes that are believers that are staying out of trouble, they snitch on all of us that are like going out. Hey, Tom, man, you know, we had Roy up in front of the, the classroom and he was out last night. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking. But so what we're trying to do is prepare you guys for what's next. And right now, I mean, let's just look at this from the Ohio Stadium perspective. If this was Ohio Stadium, now you're talking about, what, 70% pack? I mean, that's like the spring game this past, this past weekend. I mean, it's nice, but it's not 108,000. I mean, it's, it's OK. It's bigger than, watch this, it's better than the majority of the other colleges like their entire capacity for, the, for a real regular season game, we have more people in attendance for a spring game, but that's the other people. So we can say like, you know, we're a little bit better than the average person. Like we're better than the average believer. Like we, we show up at the meetings and we, we maybe have a church home on campus or something. Like we do, we do enough. Not really. Not really. Like this is real, like as like serious as you take your athletics and you know how much that means to you to want to compete, to want to be on the field or in the pool or on the mat or whatever it may be, on the court, whatever it is, like you know how much that means to you, but in comparison to your, your actual relationship with Christ, it's still not there. It's not even halfway there. Because you will do whatever it takes to get on the field, to get on the court, to get in the pool, to get recognized, to be with, like you'll do whatever you have to do. You'll run with a bad hamstring, bum ankle, I mean, it's cold outside, it's raining, tornado, it doesn't matter. You are going to perform. You're on it. Like, that's what you want to do. Like, you're all about it. But if something comes up from a believer standpoint or an opportunity to get better in your relationship with Christ, if it inconveniences you, you fall back. Eh, I can pass on this one. I mean, God's still loving me, right? I mean, I'm good. I mean, he knew that I wasn't going to go anyway, so I don't even know what the big deal is. I mean, I'm saved. I'm already forgiven. I already have a relationship with Christ. I'm good. Like, he knew that I was going to be tired after practice, so he knew that I was going to show up today. It's all right. Like, when I wake up tomorrow, it's okay. I'm blood of Jesus. Awesome. To God be all the glory. Great. And then we start building these excuses. And then we don't understand or we get confused when the areas in our lives that are supposed to be easy for us to overcome, whatever that adversity is, like, we, we can't beat it all of a sudden. It's amazing to me how many people know, they know, allegedly, so much about the Lord. Like they study their scripture every day, they, they're in their Bibles, like they know a lot. But a mature believer is not defined by what you know. It's about how you translate what you know into behavior. The whole Christian walk is about taking what you know and translating it into behavior. That's the walk. Are you changing? Your decision-making process, is it different than it was six months ago, two months ago, two weeks ago? How you handle adversity, how you handle challenges, how you respond to critics, how you respond to, to things not going your way, how you respond when you're getting pressured by your teammates or pressured by your friends or pressured by your family members to transfer, to leave, or to go this place or go to do this. Like, how are you responding? Are you taking what you know, all those scriptures that you know, all the, the scriptures that you rehearsed, and translating it into behavior? That's what maturity is. If you guys are, I don't have it, I mean, it's not up on the screen or anything, but if you 
Matthew uh, <clears throat> 16. I'll read it from my phone because um, I don't have it memorized. Tom probably does, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Matthew 16, I'm going to go first, uh, I'll, start at, I'll start at 15. Here's, here's the backdrop. Basically, Jesus is rolling around with the disciples and he's hanging out with them. And uh, he pops a, pops a question and asks them, like, hey man, what, like, who do people say that I am? It's one of my favorite scriptures. And, like, he just, yeah, he, and so he threw it out there. Who do people say? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, technology. <laughs> Where, where am I at? All right, okay. 13, 17. Okay, cool. All right, so it says, Now when Jesus came unto, uh, all right, let's get that big word. All right. <laughs> he asked the disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Oh, let me go back. By the way, every time I would get to something I couldn't pronounce when I was uh, studying with Tom back in college, I would get to a word and I would just look at him and he would look at me. And I would look at him and he said, why'd you stop? And I'm like, I don't know it. He's like, well, just try it. And that's just kind of how he got me saying it. <laughs> like, Tom will ask you a question that he knows that you don't know the answer to. Like, so, um, if you ever studied with Tom, he would ask you something like this. So, you know, uh, Caesarea Philippi, what do you think those people were like back then? <laughs> And it, so you try and figure out like a, like you're like well uh, I don't know maybe it's, they were mixed guys black guys <laughs> and so watch and then Tom will never he won't tell you that you're wrong he does it in love he'll be like no nah, they were all white people but like he, he, he'll just kind of go and tell you the real answer without making you feel horrible like he will always do that to me but anyway <laughs> uh, or he was like for example he, he asked his, his disciples who do people say that the Son of Man is. So like, before I was saved, he might say, well, who do you say Jesus is? And I would look at, I don't, I don't know, I mean, what, whoever you want me to say he is, you know, like that type of thing. He would confuse you, but it was a good study technique. Anyway, <laughs> like a bad professor, right? Anyway, um, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? So this is, this is the key part right here. So Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. So you didn't get this from Google. You didn't get this like off the internet, right? So flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father who is in heaven, all right? So I'm not going to go to 18. So here, this is how significant it is. No other place can you find where information came straight from heaven to a person that showed and told who Jesus was. Jesus wasn't even telling anybody who he was. He couldn't. He didn't want to. I'm not even going to tell people, but my heavenly father, you're so connected, my heavenly father gave you knowledge. So now you know. Like, you know. You know what's going on. Like, you know now that everything that was in the Old Testament would point to me and I'm that guy. You know it now. That's what that says. Like, you have, this has been revealed to you, my father in heaven gave you some information, some intel, some knowledge that no one else knows. All right, scroll down to verse uh, 22. Let's skip over that part. All right. So now, right after that conversation, where Jesus is high five to Simon, gave him a new nickname, called him Peter, right? Everything's all good. Three verses later, Jesus has to tell the disciples what's going to happen to him. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem must suffer from many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed on the third day and be raised from the dead. And Peter, verse 22, took him aside. Excuse me, Jesus, let me talk to you real quick. <laughs> took him to the side and began to rebuke him. There is no way we let me do this. Watch this, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Three verses ago, he just got this revelation about, about who Jesus was. I know who he is. Like, I know. This is, you guys know your scripture. The one that you keep on your Snapchat or your IG and your bio, whatever it may be. Like, you got it memorized, right? When you're praying and you're coming to AIA, you never missed. And you're like, man, I never miss. And all these things going on. And when I told you maturity was translating what you know into behavior is the definition of that word. Here's an opportunity 
for you to find out and for Peter to show how mature of a believer he is, but he did not translate what he knew into behavior. Because in this verse it says, far be it from you, Lord, this, is, this shall never happen to you. So you go from knowing that I'm the Messiah, knowing that I've come to die for your sin, to, 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 to shed my blood for you. You know something that nobody else knows because my Heavenly Father gave it to me, but you did not take what you know or what you thought you knew and show that you're a mature believer by translating to behavior. Because if he was a true, mature believer, as soon as Jesus told him, as soon as he said, I got to go to the cross and I got to die and be raised on the third day, as soon as that happened, Peter should have shifted and said, absolutely, you got to do it. Because the entire Old Testament of which I've been studying has been pointing towards you. And I know who you are. What does all this mean? Every time that you guys come in here and you get a speaker giving you information, it is not just to make you feel good for that moment. It is not for you to feel like, you know what, I've arrived. I got a scripture that I can hold on to. It'll get me through anything. The majority of people that I know, not the roadies, but a lot of people that I know that call themselves Christians and believers and they pray and they give and they go to church every Sunday and they do all these great things. All these people do this, but when a tragedy happens or when a trial happens or when an injury happens or when they get cut or when they get let go or when they get dumped by their boyfriend or their girlfriend or when they, for God forbid, went to a bar and got drunk and slept with somebody that they didn't know. When something like that happens, they don't know what to do. They panic. They fall back. They do what Peter did. See, when you don't translate, watch this. And this is how we get off, and I'm almost done. But when we don't translate what we know into behavior, see, when you don't translate, you end up trying to dictate. If you don't take what you know about Jesus to be true, and the truest of truth, like forget all the scriptures, what you know about him, that relationship, if you don't take that, and if you're not trained, and if you're not listening enough to translate that into actual behavior and the changing and the metamorphosis of your life and the sculpting of your life, if you don't, what ends up happening is you try and intercede and stop God's plans. You end up trying to dictate what you want God to do for you. So Peter did. He knew he was the son of the living God. He called him the Messiah. He said, you came to save me. But when it came down to him being mature, it wasn't going the way that he wanted to. And he wasn't using what he knew, so he tried to stop God's plan. Happens all the time. We know the scripture. We pray. We do all these things. And then when it comes down to our behavior, we find ourselves in situations that we can't get out of, and we're trying to get God to do what we need to do to get out of our situation. That's how you get caught up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because the great thing about being a believer is, number one, you got to be willing. But number two, God gave us choices, the power of choice. And so the majority of the trouble that we get into, like when Jesus went to the cross, like the resurrection Sunday that just happened, like when he went to the cross, basically everything that you want to become, everything that you want to be, all the blessings, like it's already done for you. I believe that. So now it's just a matter of making sure that my decisions and my choices line up with what happened at Calvary, what happened on the cross. So now God gives us choices. So if you choose to date a certain person, and that person ends up being, let's say, abusive physically or emotionally or verbally, right? We'll believe God and we'll pray to get out of that situation. But I believe if we were more in tune and aligned with what he wanted us to do and going off what we know, maybe we wouldn't have made that choice to date that guy or date that girl. Because now we got to make sure, God, I need you to get me back out of this situation. But you knew he wasn't going to be good for you. He, don't even, he didn't even know Peter was a disciple. And you took him out on a date. You went out on a date, he didn't even, he told you, like, hey, so you got a relationship with Christ? No, nah, not really. I mean, I believe in God. And he was like, man, he's cute, though. <laughs> Did you see his ab? Like, he got, like, nine of them. Like, I don't even know, <laughs> even know how that's possible. It's like eight and then one big one. I don't know that. <laughs> but you still win. And now you're in a situation where God has his plan and you want, to, you want him to do, you want him to do your plan. Let me tell you guys this before I go. 
<coughs> you guys have to become, how can I put this? You guys have to become predictable, predictable to God and unpredictable to Satan. You have to become predictable to God and unpredictable to Satan. Well, see, you might be thinking, well, what do you mean predictable? God already knows, knows everything. What I mean by that in incorporating, using what you know and translating into behavior, you have to, as a matter of fact, the more, the more predictable you are to God, the more responsibilities and the more of an assignment you'll get for his kingdom. See, the reason why Jesus was chosen, the reason why he was given such a large assignment is because God already knew what he was going to do. Like, he was so predictable to God that he knew that when he was approached by, to, uh, Jesus was so predictable to God that he knew that when he was tempted by Satan and when he was going through all these things, he knew no matter what he was going to go to that cross and die for him. Like, he was so predictable based on past behavior, based on past experiences. So because he was so predictable, God knew what he was going to do. It's the same thing with you all. Like, people will know your maturity about your behavior. So you get more responsibility based on your dependability and based on how predictable you are. Here's an example. If the game's on the line and I'm standing, <coughs> it's fourth and one. We're going in to score a touchdown this past fall. It's fourth, it's fourth and one. And we got to have the ball in somebody's hands that I can trust. I know that if I call this player, if I do something, I already know what this person's going to do. I know they're going to get us the first down. They call the play, J.C. Barrett gets the first down by a couple inches. But he gave him that responsibility because he already knew, Coach Meyer, the offensive coordinator, they already knew what was going to happen based on past experiences and behavior. And so you might be sitting here thinking, like, man, I, I, I need more purpose in my life. But see, God is up there saying, like, you, I already know what you're going to do. Like, if you get in this situation, if I give you what you want, you're going to fold. You're going to quit. You're not ready for it yet. You've got to be predict. That's maturity. Where I know what you're going to do no matter. Like, I know without a shadow of a doubt that Tom is never going to cheat on his wife. Like, I already know that. Like, that's a real-life situation. Why am I going to say, like, Tom's never going to miss a Bible study? Like, no, that's not real. Like, forget that. Like, something real. Like, I know that. Like, I never have to worry about, like, looking at the news and like, oh, Ohio State football team chaplain uh, Tom Rohde, AIA Campus Crusade, caught with a DUI. Like, I, I don't have to worry about it. Like, it's just some things that I know, no matter what the situation is, I know what he's going to do ahead of time. And so the question is, when you're given a situation, you're, most of the time you're not getting what you really want is because God already knows that in a situation, it's uh, not going to be a cut. The more predictable you get based on your behavior is when God starts to elevate you and give you another platform, another territory to take over. But if you're not taking what you know, you know and translating it into behavior, you end up just like Peter. Where you go from, man, I, I know something, I think I know, I'm on fire, I leave, but my behavior didn't change, and then all of a sudden, I'm trying to dictate what God does. I know more than he does. You shouldn't go. What do you mean you shouldn't go? Man, you, you're, not go you're not going to the cross. Are you kidding me? This is two verses. I don't know, maybe it's ten years in the two verses. I don't really know. But it went from a verse, then another, then another, and then here it is, Peter saying, I can't let you go. He was immature. And so everything that you guys have learned this year, all these speakers, Tim Kite, one lady came in, I believe she had an organization dealing with human trafficking. I mean, it's just a lot, you guys had a lot of different speakers coming here, had a lot of different things going on. A lot of people coming in here, a lot of prayer, a lot of study, a lot of scripture, a lot of Bible study, a lot, just a lot, just a whole lot. But if you don't take what you know and turn it into behavior, it's just what you know. That's all it is. It's what you know. You're just a person that knows how to play Madden, but you don't know how to play football in real life. You're that guy. <laughs> You're that person. You're that guy. Right? And so I want you guys to focus on one. Because see, this is where the behavior kicks in summertime right now. The shorts <laughs> are tighter and shorter. <clears throat> Dudes walking around showing their abs and arms off. 
all that's going on in summertime. Your friends that you haven't seen a whole year, now they're hanging out, now they're on campus, and now you're going home. Like behavior, like how you gonna change it? When you leave here tonight, what you posting on social media? How are you talking? What are you thinking about? Like behavior. Like every single moment is dictating the destiny of you and or someone else. Don't you know that if this guy, Tom, in the back, I have to use him because he's like my, one of my spiritual fathers, so to speak, like my stepdad, my white stepdad, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> if he had decided to make an awful decision, let's just say he just said, let's just say, let's just say, for one extra day, one extra day, he said, I don't believe in this whole Jesus thing. I'm not sitting right here. And many of you don't have the relationship. Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Somebody that committed. Somebody that sold out for Christ. It's amazing to me how many people, you know, he mentors, go off to the NFL. Man, he should be living in a mansion. As far as I'm concerned, when we get to heaven, he's going to have the dopest house in the all. <laughs> I know that. But it's amazing to me, again, priority, how you can go to the NFL after somebody guides you spiritually for four or five years, and then he puts a phone call out and doesn't hear from you ever. Like, won't even return phone calls. And then when you see him, like, oh, what's up, Tom? What's up, Brody? Like, you with Brody? <laughs> it's like seeing G, hey, what's up, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, these next, these next few months are gonna be pivotal for you all because it, maybe it's not gonna be structured like where you guys have a group of believers where that are your age and millennials or Z or X or whatever you guys, I don't really know. Um, but you guys gotta make sure everything that you guys have learned and everything that you know is translated into behavior. We need mature believers. Those that are willing to do whatever it takes, those that are willing to say no. You know that no is a complete sentence. Did you know that? Like you gotta learn how to use that sentence. Like, no, I'm not doing it. Like, my life is on the line. And if I make a mistake today, it could completely alter the next generation of following these people in my family. Like, that's how serious it is to me. And when you guys leave here, for some of you all, you're like, all right, your 25 minutes is up. You should wrap it up. But here's the thing. Uh, I really don't care about time. Like, I really don't. Like, it's very, very important for you guys to understand how serious it is. And I'm not even super deep and super spiritual. I'm a goofball. Like, I'm, I'm silly. Like, if I don't know how to say a word, I'm not going to try and say it. Like, I'm not that guy. You know, I don't have a big ego. Like, I don't care. Uh, but what I do know is summertime hits, and all the things that we know goes out the window. Because nobody's watching, nobody's looking. It's break time. But it's not. It's not. All right? And usually on break is when people get broken, and they come back broken. And they come back, and then it's packed again. That's why it's always packed at the beginning of the year. Everybody looking for prayer. Everybody know over the summer they was acting crazy at camp. You got, that's high school. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Look, guys, man, I love you guys as student athletes. I tell you guys that all the time, but you don't love me. You don't love me. Look, I do, man. Like I really do. Um, maybe three or four people or hit hit me up and say hi or thank you or try to keep in contact with me. That's fine. You know, but like I said, you got the resources, you got Jensen here, you know. Julie does a great job. I, was, I mean, you just got resources. Tasha over here yelled at me for not calling her back one time, so she's, <laughs> she's dangerous herself. <laughs> got a pistol under that Bob thing on her head. <laughs> um, she's dangerous. Um, so anyway, um, again, take what you know, translate it into and only you know if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Like, only you know that. Um, but you guys are like, like the change, we put that famous quote, be the change you want to see in the world. <coughs> as mad as half of you guys are, three quarters of you guys, or all you guys are, that Donald Trump is president, like, what you gonna do about it? Like, who cares what the Donald is doing, Mr. President is doing? I don't wanna be disrespectful, he's our president. Like, who cares what, what he's done and what he's doing? Like, what are we doing? Like, seriously. Like, if the microscope was on us and that closet got open of what we said 10 years ago, like, holy smokes. You hear how I was talking before I met that guy. 
You know what I'm saying? And so instead of judging what's already there, we need to figure out how we take our position and make sure every decision that we make over the next few years puts us in position to change the things that nobody else has deemed important. Like that's what it is. That's what being a believer is. That's what being a mature believer is. An immature believer is the person that's watching. Like, I hate him. I don't like him. I can't wait to eat that off. I can't. And I'm not advocating. I'm just saying from a believer's standpoint, what are we going to do in our walk with Christ to change the things that need to be changed? And if we don't take what we know and translate it into behavior, it's going to always be like this. It's not worth it. All right? Um, appreciate you guys. Finish the year stronger than you started. And uh, if you need me, I'll be in the weight room. Go Bucks. <laughs>